Good morning. Morning. It's good to see you all today. My name is Reverend Dr. Liz Theo Harris, and I have the honor of being uh, national co-chair uh, of the Poor People's Campaign and National Call for Moral Revival. And it is even more my honor to introduce um, the other co-chair, uh, uh, a visiting professor of social justice here at Union, uh, consecrated bishop. Um, in, from the College of Affirming Bishops, uh, the architect of the Forward Together Moral Mondays movement out of North Carolina, uh, pastor, senior pastor of Greenleaf Christian Church in Goldsboro, North Carolina, and the leading voice of a moral movement in this nation today, um, the Reverend Dr. William J. Barber II. Hello, home. Y'all give it up for Liz Theo Harris, my sister. This sister is incredible, and uh, we could not, this work could not be done without the two of us, and we're actually practicing fusion politics, <laughs> right? And uh, you ought to see people when well, Liz said, that's my brother, that's my sister, and Liz will get up and talk about race, I'll get up and talk about economics, it just messes people all up in the head, <laughs> you know? And, uh, but, but that's the point. Uh, everything we're doing in this movement, we're trying to, try not only to teach it empirically, but we're trying to teach it um, anecdotally, right? We're trying to put pictures and faces and practice all together. Uh, it is good to be here, Madam President. I'm so thank you for allowing us to be here. I, I promise you after this campaign to get this class done uh, that I'm supposed to do, because uh, I'm going to be teaching all the stuff we've learned <laughs> out in the field. Uh, Brother Davey, thank you so much, Doc, for, for all the ways in which you help us. Um, it is good to feel so at home. Union is the right place uh, that should be involved in the forefront of this movement uh, that is happening all across the country. I'm so glad to see each of you here. To Willie Baptiste who walked in. I was just talking about him yesterday. Give him a big hand. Um, really, um, when we first uh, went to Highlander to talk about bringing these two groups, Kairos and Repairers of the Breach, uh, together to help lead this um, poor people's campaign, a national call for moral revival, it centered all of us. You know, he had he had the moral authority, the experience, and the wisdom to center us. Because you know, sometimes in coming together, progressives can tear each other apart. <laughs> you know, it happens more often than not. And so, Doc, I, I'm, I'm forever grateful um, for that. Um, and Sierra, who's doing a tremendous job pulling together a national organization. Once we built from the ground up, Sierra's job has been navigating with groups and helping them to understand that we're talking about nationalizing states, so we wanted you to come in. But if you come in, you have to come in committed to. You can't just come in to put up a sign. You just can't come in for your issue. You really need to come in and be deeply committed to the three areas that I'll talk about in a minute that this campaign will focus on and it's launching. And she's, she had 80, I, I'm, I don't even know how that happened because I, you know, I mean, I, I took me th three years to get 80 to 80 in the Moral Monday movement without them kill, beating up on each other. And the other day she had more than 80 organizations to come on the phone to say they want to be a part of this um, national campaign. So give it up for Sierra. I want to thank her. To, um, and we got Shelly coming in with her baby. Shelly has been leading something that has not been done in recent history called the Souls of Poor Folk Auditing America 50 years after the Poor People's Campaign. And uh, we've been, she's been working with Institute for Public uh, Policy Studies, Urban uh, Institute, uh, impacted persons, putting them in the same room with economists, in the same room with theologians, in the same room with, with historians. And on April the 10th, a landmark document will be produced 
uh, that, that really gives a clear understanding of where we are in the five inter interlocking injustices uh, that provide provides the footnotes. I like I to say that provides the footnotes for the fussing because you want to make sure you've got legitimate discontent, <laughs> not just discontent, but legitimate discontent. And I often say that the worst thing you can do in a movement is be loud and wrong. Huh? And so, so we want to, and then my brother Larry, who is the co-chair here of Kairos and, and has had so much experience in history. And, and when we get in the room, um, Larry makes us think. Uh, he's been, I, I like to say, he's been around long enough to say, even if you don't do it all, you got to think about next steps. And we're always appreciative to get mad about it sometimes because thinking hurts. <laughs> sometimes we don't want to think any further than the immediate. But he raises questions that are necessary for us to consider uh, because they're going to come, whether you like it or not, you know. And you, be you best be ready to answer them. And, uh, and so many others. Is that Norm back there? And Norm who keeps Liz straight and everybody. Now, if I keep calling names, I'm going to miss somebody. So let me just say Roz Pellis, some of you may not know her, who was the national um, civil rights lawyer for AFLCI, was one of our co-managers of the campaign. John Parker is another co-manager. And Ben Wilkins, who helped lead the Fight for 15. Fight for 15 in the union is fully in with the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for a moral revival. And, um, and, and he's on the team as well. And where is Cla Claudia? Is Claudia here? And, huh? Okay, and then we got Javon, Javon, who's back there leading our arts and visuals and the Theo Musicology along with uh, Yara Allen. And Peter last night, I understand y'all had a big mass meeting at the Episcopal Church. I saw y'all online and Dr. Ford was all in the floor and on the seats and everywhere. I said, good Lord, what is going on over there? It must be a revival, moral revival happening in the land. Amen. So let me, this morning, this is, this is back in the day, whenever you were leading or serving, I like to say serving movers, you always came back and gave a report. What's the status? So this is a field report. We took a break from the field. Uh, we're headed doing this today. And then tonight over at um, NYU, I'm doing a speech called uh, uh, SOS, Save Our Ship of State. Um, and then we're going to um, uh, Connecticut, New Haven, and we're going to be with the Yale Divinity School as they're engaging there. And then we leave there and we're headed to Kentucky and West Virginia. We're going right in the hollows of the mountains. Uh, for two days, we're doing a tour with media embedded. We're going to places that a lot of progressives think you can't go, right? And so uh, we'll we'll be there. But we wanted to take a break from the field. I see Joe Ward here. Who's who? Joe Ward is a lead. Stand up, Joe. He's a leading uh, young man in communications. Has his own company, uh, um, and he's a tremendous young man and does some great work. So what I wanted to do, if we could bring the lights down, I think a minute. Uh oh, we lost the screen. Okay, okay, they're just, they're just covering it up. So I want to talk a little bit about, first of all, the analysis. Because in any movement, if your analysis is wrong, right, and, and I want to talk about why in this movement we talk about poor people's campaign, a national call for a moral revival, why we brought together the great work of Kairos, the work of preparers, lessons from Liz's 30 years of experience, lessons from my years of experience, and everybody's experience, the Moral Monday movement, and why we think it is critical that in this moment, we don't just follow what the talking heads are saying, we don't just listen to people telling us, well, the reason we're here is because uh, um, white working class voters, so and so and so, we, that we, don't, we do not just merely get caught up in Trump reaction or Trump, Trumpitis. Because uh, if Trump was moved tomorrow, I, America would still have lots of problems, maybe more. <laughs> because sometimes his mouth gets in his way and his feet get in his way. Uh, some people would be much smoother than him. And, and, and that's one thing. But, but, but we, we, are, we are in a moral malady and a place not because of what has happened over the last year and a half, but for because of 50 years of strategy designed to split us, designed to make us fight in isolation, 
designed to push the movement into silos. And we've got to unpack that with an analysis. So when we go around the country and teach, and by the way, you should know that we didn't just get on email and tweet and announce a movement. We've gone, um, for the last three years, we've done national tours. I'm, Liz, I'm sometimes wondering how that possible. We've done, in one year, we did 26 states in less than seven months. And last year, we did 15 states where we traveled to and train people from over 25 states in less than four months. So this is deep dive organizing. We didn't start this campaign by saying, we want to do a poor people's campaign. All the people that's got a mailbox in Washington, D.C. and a national organization, let's join and put a bunch of folk on a list and say we got a coalition. This movement is from the bottom up. It's from the bottom up. Mo because this country has not changed from Washington, D.C. down. It's changed from Birmingham, Montgomery up. Always has been, always will be. And when we went to these communities, we went by invitation. People invited us to come. We didn't go to argue with people who says we really don't need to do intersectional work and I've got my own um, silo and my own organizational ego and I want to do this. And nor did we go in and get in the room of a bunch of preachers to talk about the poor or a bunch of advocates to talk about the poor. We had the poor, the advocates, preachers all in the same space on level ground, right? And the first thing we did when we went there was we introduced them to the, uh, our, the, our understanding of the state of our democracy, if you will. The state of what we call interlocking injustices. Write that down. Interlocking injustices. Interlocking injustices. Now, we, we went in with a premise. Uh-uh, take that one off and go to the road. That's the last one I want to come up. Right, open now. We went in with the premise, after many years of studying and focused, that theologically and morally, and understanding America, you cannot separate race and class. Somebody say, is it race or is it class? We say it is. That's a false dichotomy to think we're going to understand the dynamics of this country separating them. So the first map we'd had our people develop, we asked our staff and teams, develop a map for us and show us the state of voter suppression. Now, everybody else, if you see all, if you look at CNN and MSNBC and those groups, not that I have anything against them, everybody talking about Russia and Stormy. Russia and Stormy, you know. Uh, what's the man name in Russia, the president? Putin and Stormy. You would think that's the whole, the, the, that, that, that explains everything. And you got a lot of folks in this man. The Russians, they just hacked our system. And that's why so and 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 so. Right. And even during the campaign, we had 26 presidential debates. Not just this year, but even year before. Let me t I mean, last year, but let me talk about the most recent. And we talked about tweets, emails, sex sexcapades, tapes, um, tax cuts, middle class. And as Ari Berman says, the most underreported story, the most ignored story, the most the thing that is the most egregious in this democracy right now is racialized voter suppression. And nobody's talking about it. It's not being discussed in seminaries. It's not being discussed that much in public places of public policy. And, that, and, and, and it is a very theological issue, you know, because the last time I checked, now you all can help me, I'm not that good of a theologian, so I'm coming here for y'all to help me, that, that we only give voting rights to people. Is that, is that right? I mean, does it, I'm, I'm not wrong in my constitution. 
I don't think we give voting rights to puppies, pets, and parakeets. <laughs> right. We actually say that all you have to do is be 18, what, born or naturalized in these United States of America. And as Claudia teaches us, we have to say the United States of America because we're not the only Americans. There's some South Americans. There's some Canadians that are Americans because they're in on the continent of North America. But that's a story for another day, <laughs> right? Now, if that's true, we only give it to people. To deny somebody the vote or suppress their vote, then therefore is to suggest they are not human enough. Right? Because we only give the voting power to human beings. 18. So if I deny your right to vote, I'm suggesting that, that my humanity exalts above your humanity, and therefore I can deny you something that any human being that's 18 born or naturalized in these United States has an opportunity. And last time I checked, <clears throat> that's sin because that's idolatry, which is the root of racism. It is idolatry, self-worship that plays itself out in public policy. So we deliberately asked our, uh, if I sit down, can y'all, can, can, can the live stream still here? As long as I'm kind of close, okay. So we asked these people to put it together and there's one actually, you see that little piece of land to the left bottom, left corner, what is that? Alaska. Now, we also learned something on this tour, too, since we've been working. And I, I'm, I'm, again, I'm, I'm reporting, so I'm not following the script per se. That Even that is a form of racism. How big is Alaska? Alaska's twice the size of Texas and bigger than half of the United States. How is it always shown on the map? What's always shown as the biggest? The land that was stolen by racism because when Mexico decided it wasn't going to be a slave state, the white slave owners in Texas didn't like that, so that's why they pulled out of Mexico. But Alaska, that has more than 200 tribes, and if all of them were organized, Alaska, the, the Alaskan tribes could control Alaska. The only place when we went to Alaska to, to visit the poor there, they told us that there's one thing America and Russia never fight over, and that's who's going to rape Alaska next. Who's going to do it next? Is that good? And so even that, now that, that what we, and so that, there should be some green in that map too. Y'all see it? But the point I'm trying to make is, we had our experts look at this, and they showed us that since 2010, not 2011, not 2016, not 2017, not when Trump got elected, but since 2010, we have seen voter suppression, racialized voter suppression, happening in this country the likes of which we have not seen since Jim Crow. Long before the bots. Right. And since 2013, June 25th, 2013, we have seen an, uh, uh, voter suppression on steroids once the Supreme Court in a five to four vote decided to gut the Voting Rights Act by removing preclearance that actually covered some counties and areas in here in New York. And Ruth Bader Ginsburg, remember when that happened, she sounded more like a prophet than a Supreme Court justice. She warned us what was going to happen. And it did. So much so, it's happening so much so, my friends, that recently in a case out of North Carolina that we fought six years to over, four years to overturn, the Roberts Court including Clarence Thomas, voted unanimously that the North Carolina legislature six years ago passed a vote, I mean five years ago, passed a voter suppression law that was surgical racism. 
use those laws to get elected and, have, and the legislators have been in office for more than five years via unconstitutional voting law, which means we have a lot of unconstitutionally constituted politicians in this country. Not 1940, not 1950, 60, 70, 80, 90, 2016, but since 2010. That's the penetration point that we are using in this campaign to talk about racism, to, get, to have a conversation and a focus on racism that does not devolve into just a personal, personal, you know, do you have any black and white friends kind of thing. That, that, that can so easily happen, even after Charlottesville. The conversation does not go to policy. It does not go to really what white nationalism stands for, because white nationalists aren't really concerned about statutes, they are concerned about statutes. Right. Voter suppression, look at it, look at that map real good. Include Alaska. Even New York is up there. I know y'all like to think that New York is so delivered. <laughs> you all are not like those Southerners. <laughs> but in some ways, what goes on in New York is more tragic than in the South. Because at least in the South, <laughs> they tell you pretty much what they're going to do. I mean, they, we told them they were wrong. We showed them the fact. But right here in North New York, you can have a quote unquote Democratic Senate, Democratic House, Democratic governor, and you all still only have one day for voting, which is a form of voter suppression. This state still has not passed that people are automatically registered at 18. In North Carolina, we got same day registration and early voting, like 10, 12, 15 days. Whatever the number is. Up here, y'all. And your city is way bigger than ours. I'm just saying. So, if, look at the map. Since 2010, all this voter suppression has gone on. The light color, the green set, shows where there are voter suppressions pending since 2017. And I want you to look at that map good. And I want you to look at, how many of y'all know your, your state pretty good? You see Virginia? Virginia? And if you go all the way over to Texas, you see Texas? If you, if just that green is 171 electoral votes in a race to 270. If you control just from Virginia to Texas, you control 26 members of the United States Senate, which means you only need 25 from the other 30 of the, fifth, of the 37 states to control the United States Senate. If you can control from Virginia to Texas, you control 31 percent of the United States Congress, which means you only need to pick up 20 percent from the other 37 states. And guess where it is that most progressives and Democrats don't even try to run? Don't even try to work in those same states. And guess which states the demographics have changed over the last 50 years that have the most potential for organizing. But if we get stuck in an old narrative, and guess where the most poverty is? So one of the things we wanted our team, because Liz and I said, we're not going out till we understand the analysis. And the analysis had to be deeper than, we need to do something to get rid of Trump. We have a, 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 some interlocking injustices that keep us from progress and have held us back and, and have reneged on the promises of the past. And it starts with, for us, dealing with systemic racism as illustrated clearly through voter suppression. Because we've said you cannot talk about poverty and a moral revival that doesn't deal with race and class together. Right. Now, watch this. Go to the next map. Now, these are the states, the dark part, 
where you have more than 24 percent of the people living in poverty. The majority, by the way, in those states are white, poor. Now, of percentage of race, black, but in raw numbers, white. And if you notice, the states with the highest poverty are the same states with the highest voter suppression. Go to the next one. Oh, New York is still up there. I want y'all to get too arrogant around here. You see it? Women in poverty, not black, just women. Same states, almost identical, that have voter suppression, have high levels of women in poverty. Next one. Poverty in general. Look over there, for instance, at New Mexico, for instance. We, were, we, 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 did, a, we did training in New Mexico. Ain't a whole lot of difference between, notice no difference between Mexico and Mississippi or Alabama. See how dark Alabama is? Is that Alabama? Right over top of Louisiana. That's Mississippi. But you see, you can put New Mexico and Mississippi. Now, the, 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 the demographics are different because you got the Pueblo people and whatnot. But in terms of the poverty rate and in terms of voter suppression, it, it's really not a lot of difference. Look at, look at how dark, um, uh, for instance, Alabama is, and then go over to Nevada. Poverty rate. And, and by the way, you know that you're not in poverty, according to the government, if you make $23,835 and you have a family of four. Just want you to know, you're not poor. Next one. Whew. Now, the same states that have all of this voter suppression, minus a few, are the same state that refused to expand Medicaid. And that makes up more than 8 million Americans, right? And thousands of veterans, but 8 million Americans. Notice it. And billions of dollars. So whether you're in Texas or look up there around South Dakota, North Dakota, what's that, Oregon? What's that? The one with the, what's the, uh, Utah, is that Utah? The squiggly line. Idaho. Idaho, right. And then all the way up where? Maine. Right. Next one. Same, go, if you keep in your memory voter suppression, you look at this map, same states for the most part were states where people living without a living wage. Now, the darker spaces is where the state has no minimum wage, where they haven't even gone in and said the federal wage may be such and such thing, but I'm at least raise it here in this state. And in the next one. Hmm. The same states that engage in racialized voter suppression have the worst laws protecting the LGBTQ community. Next one. The same states that have the worst voter suppression laws have the highest numbers of people who claim to be Protestant evangelical. Now, before you shake your head, because I'm a Protestant evangelical, we don't see that as a negative. See, around here, I think there's a scripture y'all may have learned around here. We see that as a possible harvest. Because, see, if, if we get so arrogant, we write off people. See, I think that there's potential there because some, see, people will follow false prophecy until something else comes along. The point we're trying to make, though, by look, go back to that voter suppression map, is that we, when we go in and teach, we show people that if you merely start with voter suppression, racialized voter suppression as your beginning, 
and you look at the data, you can hypothesize, you can conclude that the very people who get elected by racist voter suppression laws, once they get elected, use that power to hurt all people. So that racism is not just against black people, it's against the democracy itself. And that's the message that we, we aren't hearing in our public discourse, which keeps people divided, left, right, liberal, conservative. When in fact, we need to raise up some people who understand this analysis and can help show it to people to say to all of those folk, you're mad because you don't make a living wage? Well, guess who's voting against your living wage? The persons who are fooling you on the issues like being against the LGBT community, against abortion, and the people who get their election, electoral power, not by fair elections, but through racialized voter suppression. And there has to be a movement that connects those things because the parties don't want to connect it for whatever reason. You know, we had 26 debates in 2016. You didn't hear one word about this, voter suppression. We, we are, today as we sit in here, and I repeat it over and over again, we sit in this room and we have less voter suppression, voting rights today than we had in 1965, because the Voting Rights Act has been gutted. This is why the gay community can't say, well, we're just, we're going to fight for marriage amendment, but we're not going to be on the side of those fighting against voter suppression. This is why neoliberals can't say, well, we're just going to find an economic argument and not deal with the race piece. This is why African Americans and brown people can't just say, well, voting rights is our issue. We're not going to connect with these people who are also living in poverty and without Medicaid. This is why we have to go after the narrative that when we talk about, that, uh, that talks about entitlements and the way it's talked about and said, it becomes a new, it's a code word for race and it means black and brown people because the majority of the people being denied health care are white. And so uh, there has to be a movement and that's what the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival is about. It is about this intersectional response to these interlocking injustices. And, and this has nothing to do with Trump. This existed prior to Trump. Now Trump may have used it, Trump may have conned his way in, but before Trump, this reality allowed us to have an election where a person could get three million votes more and be the loser. But also what allowed that to happen is the person in the party and the persons in the party that got three million more votes chose not to deal with these issues. <laughs> chose not to deal with them. Right? In fact, chose to kind of draw some line around if we can win this state, this state, this state, and didn't realize the voter suppression is so deep that, for instance, in Wisconsin, Trump won by 30,000 votes, but there were 250,000 votes suppressed. 35% of African Americans in Alabama are blocked from voting right now according to the current voting laws. So it's not that, that, that you can't win in the South, it's you got to challenge those laws. There were 898 fewer polling places in the black, brown, and poor white community in this past election. This, this is, had nothing to do with Russia. nothing to do with Russia. And so we need an analysis because the tendency in our, in our microwave view of looking at politics is not to be a movement but to have a moment. And in the moment we just focus on a person. And then we say that the next election we're going to fix it. No. And, and that's the problem. We put all our apples in the next election card. If it goes well, then we turn it over to the politicians, and then the politicians who just don't have a movement to push them, they end up doing this thing called finding common ground and label everybody else as being 
a rabble rouser. I was listening last night to Hope and Fury, and it's funny how people are saying language and they don't even realize where they got it from. So I was hearing somebody calling the students yesterday a rabble rouser, and I heard the, the governor of Mississippi in 1960 calling the rights actors the same thing, rabble rouser. But we get these people who want to just focus on common ground when what is happening is quite common. Now, common in the South don't mean something good. My grandmama said you were common. <laughs> she wasn't being nice. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Um, so we, we said together, Liz and the team, look, we've got to do this analysis. And the analysis is we've got to get people, a remnant of people, who will come together and say, we need this Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival, but we need to focus on five areas. One, system, and, and they can never be separated. And we have to show that these areas do not affect the small group of people, but they in fact affect us all. We have to show people that poor people are not just, there are people living on the street and this is ugly and mean, but you, you're not that far from there. <laughs> All right. So we had to do systemic racism with a particular focus on voter suppression, uh, systemic poverty, and we had to develop the data. If it was there, we didn't assume it was there, we had folk go search that says, stop saying there are only 40 million poor people in America and minimizing it. There are 40 million people in America that are quote unquote poor by that standard. That's a 1960 standard. But if you look at all the people that are poor, working poor, and who get supplements from the government that if they're cut, it's 140 million people. and the majority are women and children and white. And the highest percentages are black and native and Alaskan and brown. But then we also need to deal with ecological devastation and what's happening to the community. Liz makes this point, and I, she makes it all the time. I, I, do, I talk about the, the ugliness of people being able to buy unleaded gas and can't buy unleaded water. But Liz makes a different point. She says, have you ever thought about, you have people, for instance, in Flint dying and be, not, well, be, get made sick, lead in their water, and they're closer to the largest freshwater deposit in the whole country, Might, maybe in some most parts of the world. It's sitting right there, you can see it. So you got to deal with ecological devastation. Then you have to deal with the war economy and militarism. Now that's a slash in there, war economy and militarism. Now we've had people criticize us for that. We've had people say, now look, you're going to drive some people away from your campaign if you, if you deal with the war thing. And, and because you know. And we say, well, <laughs> but you can't deal with systemic racism, systemic poverty and ecological devastation without dealing with the war economy because a lot of the, um, for instance, the ecological devastation is caused by the war machinery. Plus, you can't deal with the poverty issue because if 63% of all the money, every discretionary dollar, is going into the war machinery, plus, even if you could afford the war, as long as you allow this notion that if we, the biggest is, are the baddest and we have the authority to beat people down and take what we want, that reinforces racism because that's how racism got its hold in this country. We violently went after the native community. In, in recent years, we've only went, gone to war with black and brown countries and even with Bosnia, they were Muslim. So, and, and the, mil the, militarization, the militarization of the police and what that's doing to black and brown people and women and men and boys and girls. So you can't separate these issues. And, and I know, and, and maybe some people will, and that's fine. We're not mad with those who work in their silos, but we said there needed to be a movement that tried to build without separating. And then the last thing we said, is looking at that map 
that we have to have a movement that takes head on, that goes right at the distorted moral narrative of Christian nationalism. Not with the hope of just destroying people, because that's the movement's got to be rooted in love and truth, not just truth, because truth can be so hard and and, 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 and love, if it's defined wrong, can be so weak and doesn't speak truth, but we need it both. And the reason is because, you know, I tell my church all the time, if I didn't believe in the possibility of redemption, I would quit preaching tomorrow. See, I'm not, I, I can't preach for a check. <laughs> and I can't preach for a vocation. I got to believe it will make a difference. And I got to believe it will make a difference even with people who are different from me. And even with people. So that all that map you saw about Protestant evangelicalism, I've got to believe that a lot of folk there just haven't heard the gospel. They just haven't heard prophetic truth. It's not that they're just dumb, mean people. That's not the point. They've been lied to. They've been hoodwinked. They've been bamboozled. <laughs> right? Right? And it's not just with white evangelicals, because you got a whole lot of Black evangelicals that ain't doing nothing but having a party, they've lost their prophetic edge too, right? But the point is we can't allow the heresy of Christian nationalism to keep, just sit there unchallenged. Because before Russia, it was that stream of Christian nationalism that gave a little covering, just a little covering in other words, they did Ezekiel 22 to Trump, for instance. And they've not just done it for him, they've done it for so many, but the most recent example, they did Ezekiel 22. You know, Ezekiel 22 says, your politicians are like wolves. They devour the women. It's in the book. They hurt the poor. No justice for the immigrant and the stranger. But then Ezekiel says, but there is something worse than that. Your preachers cover up for the politicians. I tell you all to read that Bible sometimes, some good stuff in it. <laughs> right? So, say, write down in, 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 interlocking injustices require an intersectional response. Now, the response we believe and what we've seen in the, in the field, we need a moral analysis to, to free us from the puny language of left versus right, Democrat versus Republican, liberal versus conservative. A moral, right? Because that allows us to have entry in communities that otherwise wouldn't listen to us. Now that morality can be from Christian, Muslim, Hindu, or it can be people not of faith, but they look at the deep moral principles of the Constitution. But whatever that is, we've said that we need to have a moral conversation. That, that what, when, 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 as you've heard me say here before, when somebody can run for office and stand up in your face and say, if you elect me, I'm gonna take your health care and let you die, and you still vote for him, you have something deeper than a political problem. We also said, we call this inter intersectional fusion. And a fusion movement is like, how many physicists in here we have? How many, any physicists? You know, the sun is bright because of fusion. Fusion is when these atoms come together and unite and they create more light. They're, they're powerful by themselves, but when they fuse, that's when they create more light energy. And fusion is when when, when I'm not just in a coalition to get my issue fixed, right? We also said that this movement needed to have nonviolence at the center so that things don't get distracted, but it needed to be nonviolent, moral, fusion, direct action. We also have said that this campaign needed to be a launching, not an end. So we're not doing this because it's the 50th year of Dr. King's, uh, you know, you don't commemorate an assassination. I'm telling a lot of folks, I'm just so bothered by that. How are you going to commemorate? They killed. You don't commemorate the assassination of prophets. 
you go to where the blood was spilled, reach down in the blood, pick up the baton and carry it the next way. <laughs> you don't allow cities to make money off the death of your prophet. <laughs> you know? And so we said, not a commemoration, but we needed a reconsecration, a reengagement. Right? Right? We also said that in this campaign, um, it needed to be, as Liz says, a season that launches the movement, but with the goal of a multi-year movement. Because we are, we are not naive that sometimes when you engage in moral movements, the, 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 the immoral people don't get better first. They may get worse. Right? We also noted that it needed to be in some place other than just D.C. Because we need to teach people what, that what's, what's, what's most, what has created the majority of the problems we have comes up from the states. See, it's in the states that voting laws are set. States deny labor rights. States deny living wages. States can block health care. States can pass laws against the LGBT community. States can do this. Now, that's not to say that they're in power in the federal, but we need to focus on the state houses and then in D.C. on the Congress. And the reason we're saying we don't want to focus on the Congress because I personally think, maybe this is just me, that part of some of this stuff that we see happening with the Trump administration is not just craziness. Some, some of it is crazy as a fox. See, I'm convinced now that some people who may say they disagree that they don't, you know, with his antics, they don't mind his antics because it gives them cover for the other stuff they're doing. Because see, while we're looking at storming, they are storming the federal bench and putting all these. You see what I'm saying? While we're looking at storming and Russia, they just passed a budget where they rolled back an Obama provision that said, okay, you can raise the military budget, but for every dollar you raise the military budget, you have to give a dollar for domestic spending. That's over, and it happened so quietly. And I didn't even agree with the Obama piece. You know, I'm, I don't agree, but I mean, that, that piece, you can't raise it, I'm not gonna sign the thing unless you do both, it's gone. And so, and so when you put that many generals around you, one of the tactics of the military is diversion. Am I right? Anybody in here observed? That's a major tactic. Bannon was a Navy SEAL. SEALs go in with small groups. How do they, how do they accomplish? They use diversion. They start a fire over here, but they really working over here. And Bannon told us the goal. He said the goal was the deconstruction. Well, you're not just going to tear my house down if I'm watching you. I've got to do something to distract. So we said that we needed to focus on the Congress because let's take, for instance, the issue of voter suppression real quick. Um, the voting rights was gutted by who? Voting rights that was gutted by who? What was the date? June 25th. Don't ever forget that date. 2013. Where was it sent? Where was their decision sent? After the Supreme Court gutted the Voting Rights Act. Let's go to class. After the Supreme Court was voted to gut the Voting Rights Act, what happened to their decision? Where is it now? In the Congress. See, I'm glad you did that, Frown. See, that's the stuff we got to teach folk that when the Supreme Court, what they did was they gutted Section 4. Section 4 was the formula for how to determine which states are still committing enough racism through voter suppression to have to go through preclearance. The formula has to be set by Congress. So the Supreme Court did something real shrewd. They said, we're going to strike down Section 4 thereby nullify Section 5, but then we're going to leave it up to the Congress to fix it. So since two th June 26, 2013, who could have fixed it? McConnell, Boehner, and Ryan. Now, and, and if they fix it, then state governments couldn't be doing what? Passing voter suppression without it having to be what? pre-cleared. 
Thereby, therefore, a lot of the people you have in Congress wouldn't be in Congress. A lot of the attacks on voters, the, vote, the attacks on voting wouldn't have happened. Thereby, you might not have as many people elected who are against living wages, who are against programs to help the poor. Am I making sense? So what does Congress do? Sit on it. How long have they sat on it? Since June 25th, 2013. How long is that? I don't know exactly. I know it's over a thousand days. Now here's the point. How long did Strom Thurmond filibuster the Civil Rights Act of 1957? One day. How many days did George Wallace stand in the door of the college? One day. And, they, and King called that interposition and nullification. So now if Wallace stood in the door one day, we called him a racist. Strom Thurmond, filibuster, the Civil Rights Act of 57, we called him a racist. Ryan McConnell and Boehner have refused to fix the Voting Rights Act for over a thousand days. And we call other folk racists for doing stuff for one day. Am I making this sense? And, and, and so what, they, and what they've done set up. The Brennan Center says that the United States House of Representatives would probably have 18 seats the other way if it wasn't for ge racist gerrymandering and voter suppression. Right? So my point is, we said we need to focus on the Congress and these state capitals. And this, this movement didn't just need to take people like they did in 68, not anything wrong with that, but our strategy need to be different. It's not about getting three or 4,000 people in D.C. alone. We needed to raise up people in all these states. So we went out all over the country. This is my report. We went out all over the country, and we started training, and we asked people to do 1,040 slash 40. Get 1,000 people, impacted people and others, people who are willing to stand with the poor, not for the poor, who are willing to be trained in this fusion understanding, who are willing to engage in 40 days of direct action to shift the narrative, to force another analysis into the public square. Because if you don't shift the narrative, you cannot change. You cannot change the agenda. And I'm reporting to you today, the report is with that analysis, with that understanding, with a lot of hard work, with going to all these places and training and doing mass meetings, I can report to you today that we have 39 states that have coordinating committees from Alaska to Alabama, from California to the Carolinas, that have been trained. We just spent three days in Nashville with, with the, the, the steering committee, and every steering committee has to have an impacted person, a clergy leader, and an advocate that have equal leadership authority, equal leadership authority. And these coordinating committees, we only, we only wanted to get 20, 25, but 39 states have now come in, and they are prepared to launch simultaneous, nonviolent, moral, fusion, direct action on the Monday after Mother's Day. And Jim Lawson told us in Nashville, this has never been attempted before in America. And he orchestrated and organized the, the, um, the Poor People's Campaign and much of the direct action of Dr. King. Now, are the coordinating committees exactly perfect? No. Is it going to look like your corporate office? No. Is it going to look exactly like your administration of your church? No. But the fact that people are responding and hearing in 39 states and who recognize that if you, if you could just get, you realize there has never been in this country a thousand people that have done direct action and ended up in civil disobedience in state houses uh, in, in, in since I think when they told the historians told we did it in Monday in Mar Monday it was the first time it happened I'm talking about at one time in, in over a period of time and if this and when this happens across the country 
Can you imagine the first day, the first Monday in all those states? Why are they, what's going on? Well, they've said that it's immoral for what's happening with children and women and the disabled and are demanding a shift in the moral narrative. And then what if those same thousand people then become voter mobilizers? And, uh, and they work specifically among the 140 million people. And then what if those people also build power? And what if they launch a movement and it's over a period of time and not just for a moment? That's what's afoot in the country. Wouldn't have happened without Kairos's work. Wouldn't have happened without union. Wouldn't have happened without the great support. Wouldn't have happened without the Moral Monday family, fought together Moral Monday family. And now I want to show you something that might just shock you by video because you know all that stuff that you saw with the young people yesterday? Well, let's see what the young people are saying about this kind of organizing. The young people. the March for Our Lives movement are reinforcing the importance of holding elected officials accountable and using their voices to provoke change. My next guests know all about fighting for justice for those whose voices might not otherwise be heard. Back with me is Matt Post, a high school student from Montgomery County, Maryland, who spoke yesterday at the march in D.C. And joining me now is Bishop William Barber, president and senior lecturer of Repairs of the Breach, and Wensler Nosey, founder of Apache Stronghold and former chairman of the San Carlos Apache Tribe. Thank you all for being here. Uh, Bishop Barber, you tweeted yesterday, listening to these students today, I know this is just the beginning. We may see sit-ins in Congress and state capitals and massive voter turnout this fall. Tragic deaths are being turned into a resurrection movement against guns and violence. Hallelujah. Um, and we have, we, we actually brought Matt back because he was in an earlier segment, but we know that he is an admirer of yours. And so you have a chance to give him some direct counsel and advice on how to take this movement to the next level. Well, you know, Joy, I'm actually taking a lot of advice from these young people. The Bible says that we shall be led by a child. I think people forget that Jesus was 12 years old when he was straightening out the elders of his day. Uh, from the civil rights movement to the Vietnam uh, anti-war movement, young people led it. What I would say to you, Matt, is first of all, thank you. What, is, what you, you all are doing is powerful. Uh, it, it really where the student activists are acting like more like moral adults while the extreme politicians are acting more like children. It's also penetrating because your movement is helping us to deal with policies of death. So, and, we, and you will help us make the connection that the same extreme politicians that block universal health care that causes people to die, that block living wages that causes people to die, that poisons uh, water and, and, and prevents environmental uh, regulation that allows people to die, are the same people that block voting rights that people died for, are the same people that are protecting assault weapons more than they are protecting children. And if we can make these connections, we can build a powerful fusion movement because we understand that we're all fighting essentially the same kind of extreme political ideology. And lastly, what is so promising is because I heard you all say enough, but I also heard you say you're not going to stop protesting, that this was a just, be just the beginning. Make sure that people say this is a movement, not a moment, and, not, and that you're not going to stop voting, you're not going to stop registration, and, when you, and if you get ready to do sit-ins, we need to do those too until they hear us, because you're right and stay on the right course. It is so powerful. I'm so Matt, inspired. Uh, Dr. Barber, as Joy said, I, I, you are one of my heroes, and I've been following you since Moral Mondays in North Carolina. Uh, and I have to ask, because it's, it's so easy for people my age to become cynical and disenchanted with this process, H how do you stay so optimistic that, that change is possible and that it's all going to work out? Well, one of the things, that, first of all, when efforts like
like this happen, it, it, it causes you to have hope. You know, I'm not always optimistic, but I'm hopeful because hope comes up through the despair. And something grabs you and says, even if they don't change right now, I'm going to, I'm going to, push the change because it's the right thing to do mm. and, and that's what's so tremendous when, and when we can come together you know the poor people's campaign a national call for a moral revival is starting on uh, the Monday after Mother's Day and we're gonna have 40 days of direct action and young people are joining that too the hope comes from fighting the hope comes in the midst of standing. We get hope when we see somebody like Chief Winsler, who's on with us, standing up in, the, in, in, the, in Arizona, the Apaches, standing up because people are poisoning water that will hurt children. Hope grows out of the struggle for justice mm -hmm. and the struggle for love. And let's bring in uh, Chief Wensler, um, and because, you know, one of the things I do hear this a lot is that, you know, we talk about all of these movements, whether it's movements against gun violence, uh, movements uh, against um, the harm to the poor that's being done by our government. Um, and I do hear a lot that, you know, we need to talk more about the harm that's being done to our first people, to the Native Americans in this country. Uh, we did a lot of coverage when that pipeline, the, no D the DAPL pipeline was being, you know, pushed through the Dakotas. Um, but, you know, the struggle for, for, for your communities is often really really invisible. So tell us, um, you know, tell us what we need to know uh, in order to connect your movement to the rest of these movements. Well, I think it's really important when it comes to the history of the founding of America. And as I say across the country, there's a first chapter to, to this whole thing. And we, if we can unlock that door, we'll be able to identify these policies and rules and, and how America was founded. Because the first chapter really carries all that hardship. And, and because of that first chapter, we were put under the, the rug, never to be heard, never to be seen. And that's why in this movement is so crucial because it's an overall healing, not just one section. It's gonna take all of us to come together. And like I tell many of the people, when it comes to colonization, the white people were colonized first. Then ever, ever since then, everybody else now comes to the native people here in North America that has seen this transformation happen and come here and so that's why I say to my native brothers and sisters, it's going to take us all to unify together to stop what is evil mm -hmm. happening across yeah. this country. And that's why it's so important. Uh, George, I, I want to jump in here because I have never cried like I cried when I went to visit Chief Winsler on the Apache Reservation in Arizona and heard the children talk about their fear because a multinational company is drilling in that land you know and it was and it was given over by a politician but they're drilling joy and 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 polluting the aquifers that are not just going to hurt people on the reservation but hurt all people and then the waste that comes to the top if it's airborne it causes cancer and to hear these young people fearing for their lives fearing for their future uh and this is happening on federal land which is all of our land sacred land where um, they're, even, they're even having a tax where their holy church, their holy land is being destroyed right in front of the children. And the children are joining the chief and leading this effort to saying we have to stop this. And that's what I say to all of these young people. We have to connect in a fusion all of these movements. The movement against assault weapons, the movement for health care, the movement for voting rights, the movement to protect children on reservations. All of them are a moral movement that we must bind together. And you know what I love about uh, you guys, Matt, is that you, your generation already knows that. Absolutely. There is a soullessness to our politics, as mm. Dr. Barber was saying. And we are going to change that. We're going to bring compassion to government because we are a compassionate generation that has a strong sense of our moral values and what is right and wrong. We have to differentiate between the greed of our politicians and these different lobbies and what is going to help the most amount of people. Yeah, absolutely. And Chief Wensler, uh, talk to me about the young people um, that are uh, a part of the Apache Nation. And, and you know, we, we. Did you hear that? He said, there's a soulishness. Now, he ain't not in the divinity school. But that young folk, bro brother said, if you want to connect with these young people, number one, they already understand that you can't do this in a silo. They are just using this, part, not using it, that this has been forced upon them, but they understand the connections, the fusion. He said, there's a soulishness, and we come to bring compassion. So all of the people are talking about how do we reach the young people? 
You better have moral movement. You better have poor people campaign a national call for a moral revival because there's a soulishness. And I didn't say that. That wasn't scripted. That wasn't even planned. We were supposed to be on just me and, and Chief Winsler, and this young man was on the earlier section, session and asked to stay on the air. And then called afterwards, Liz, and said, I want to know how we can launch with y'all. So on that show, you see, and the Apaches have sent a cry out to the other native tribes, and we're having a council on April 23rd on the reservation in Arizona, where we sit in the circle with the different nations. You see, that's why this analysis is so critical. Now, one other, show the one, this one. I want you just to see this about what is possible and why we cannot give up. And when you see evangelical, you can't automatically bleh. It's race, class, and especially now, our politics. But in our next Race Matters conversation, NewsHour special correspondent Charlene hunter Galt talks with the co-authors of The Third Reconstruction, how a moral movement is overcoming the politics of division and fear about their success in bridging these divides. In recent weeks, Reverend William Barber stepped down from heading the NAACP in North Carolina to focus on what he calls a national moral revival, updating the Poor People's Campaign, started by the Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. that linked the civil rights struggle for African Americans to demands for equality for all poor people. There was this thing, if you will, called the White Southern Strategy. And the goal of it was to undermine black and white fusion coalition. What we're going to do is we're going to figure out a way to talk that makes poor whites think that they're losing because black people and brown people are gaining. And what you do in that is you make poor whites and who should be allies with poor blacks think that their problem, their poverty, is being caused because black and brown people are acquiring something or taking something from them. So what, what led you to try and bridge that gap? And what made you want to do that? Dr. King said back in the 60s, he said, the only transformative force that could really fully transform America would be for poor whites and blacks and brown people and working people to come together Jonathan Wilson Hartgrove's conversion began when he first met Reverend Barber. Before that, he'd been a young Republican who had worked both for the Moral Majority, a political group associated with the Christian right and the Republican Party, and also for conservative South Carolina Senator Strom Thurmond. What, were you, what was your own attitude about poor black people and black people in general? Well, so I was raised in the Southern Baptist Church in a sundown town until 1983 there was a sign at the edge of our town that told black people they weren't welcome there after the sun went down. I've read that you call yourself a racist in those sure. days. I didn't know I was a racist, but Reverend Barber helped me see that I was a racist and more importantly that my racism was getting in the way of loving Jesus which is what I really wanted to do. Wilson Hartgrove first heard Reverend Barber some 20 years ago at a meeting called by the North Carolina governor. Reverend Barber delivered a motivational speech to a gathering of young people. Wilson Hartgrove was moved by what Barber said and began to understand how racism had been used as a tool to divide. Growing up poor, Wilson Hartgrove had never before realized what he had in common with poor black people. We were taught to believe that there were people who were poor because they chose to be poor. Mm -hmm. and, and that narrative kept us from seeing the way that our religion was being used to pit us against other people. Reverend Barber has even taken his message into Appalachia and up to Mitchell County, North Carolina. You know, Mitchell County, North Carolina, is a place where in 1920 all the black people were run out of town over the accusation of a black man raping a white woman. It's 97 percent white, 77 percent Republican. Wary but undeterred, Reverend Barber seized on the invitation of this rural white church. I went in and talked to them for about an hour, and I said, listen, this legislature just cut denied Medicaid expansion. There are 1,000 people in this county that would get health care, and they can't be black because there's no black people up here. They cut funding for public education. You are losing teachers here. 
and, mo and they have to be white. Now, you voted for some of the people because what they told you, they stood on prayer in the school and abortion and homosexuality. But let's look at what they're doing and how it's hurting you. So basically what you did was to talk to them about the things that they had in common and it, and it registered, it, it permeated their consciousness. You talk to people honestly, you talk to them about what it means to be a human being and you show them the hypocrisy. You know, you show them how they're being fooled, if you will, that people are saying, I care about your best interest, but those people are actually putting in place policies that are hurting everybody. What strategy did you use to reach people who had been brought up like Jonathan? What did you do to convince them that this was not right? I know that many of my white evangelical friends or many African Americans who were bought into this kind of a public engagement type faith really have been introduced to, and I say this very sorrowfully, a form of heresy and a form of theological malpractice. Uh, to try to suggest that Jesus was just about a little prayer and a little preaching and a little worship and a little charity. But the very Jesus that white evangelicals claimed to lift up was a brown-skinned Palestinian Jew whose first sermon was challenging the economic exploitation of the empire. Reverend Barber and Wilson Hartgrove have been working together in a multiracial movement known as Moral Monday, weekly protests held on the grounds of the North Carolina State Capitol in Raleigh, aimed at helping citizens understand their common interests around such issues as health care, voting rights, and immigration. Also, how they are affected by these and other governmental policies, regardless of race or class. When we went into the first Mall Monday in a diverse role as clergy investment, first some people laughed, they said we were a nuisance, but then they started seeing more people come and they looked diverse. They said, that's my teacher getting arrested, that's my doctor, that's a black man and a white man walking together, that's a Jew and a rabbi and a Christian. What's going on? So people began to come, even though they didn't get arrested, they would come. The Moral Monday movement is the foundation for Reverend Barber's latest project that he intends to take to some 25 states. What can be learned from our experience is that white people need to talk about race honestly. Uh, we need to say, uh, of course we're racist. This is a country that's built on white supremacy. You know, it's, it's not like a personal failing. I inherited this. R racism is about structures that pass on what we inherited, right? Inequalities that, that we inherited are written into these structures. And, and when we help white people think about that, um, I think we're, we're making it possible to form alliances yeah. that we yeah. haven't been able to form. And black people can't be afraid of that. We have to look back in history. When black and white people came together right after the Civil War, we fundamentally changed this country. When black and white and brown people and Jews and Christians came together in the Civil Rights Movement, it was transformative. Are you at all optimistic that the kinds of things that you're doing are going to make a difference in ending racism? I think racism is the fundamental challenge to the American project. This is a country that was built on the original sin of race-based chattel slavery. It is how the, you know, concentrated capital in this country from the very beginning has maintained power. But I don't think that, uh, that the future of America is possible without dealing with it. I'm hopeful. Optimism is a different thing. I believe we have to be the kind of what I call moral dissenters, moral defibrillators who shock the nation. But, but we also are seeing something in the wind. You have white people marching with Black Lives Matter. Mm -hmm. I heard a friend of mine who's a Sikh, and she put it like this she, quickly. She said, a tomb is dark and a womb is dark. Mm -hmm. But there's a difference. A tomb is death, a womb is possibility. It's dark now, but if we push together and come together, I think this is a birthing moment. For the PBS NewsHour, I'm Charlene Hunter-Galt. So I have one more report, but I wanted you to see that and to see the pictures. That's like we're putting a face on the back. We're not talking about proposing. We're, we've seen in Mitchell County and the other county, Liz has deep history and videos that she can show. And this is recent. Right in the midst of all this other stuff where the TV is choosing to show other things, something else is going on. 
And the last piece I want to show you is using this analogy, talking like this, going with places. This last one is actually showing you across this country what is happening with the Poor People's Campaign, the National Call for Moral Revival. I want you to look at the diversity in the crowds. I want you to look at when the cities and the states that come up. I want you to hear what Liz is saying in those places. And I want you to get ready to join us uh, on that first Monday in New York and in Washington, D.C. It'll be at uh, 2 o'clock, the rally, 3 o'clock. We're gonna, you're all going to get flyers and everything. We'll, we'll go through that. And even if you don't do the direct action, as you saw, people would come and witness. Sometimes we'd have 10,000 people witnessing 100 people. But the point is we were together, and it began to shift the moral narrative. So I want to show you this comes from what happened over the last, what, six months, Liz, six, maybe six months um, in terms of organizing this last piece uh, of the report. I hope I get a fair, we, Liz, are you grading? Well, whoever's grading today, I hope we get a fairly decent report. All right. like the old mass meetings we're here and all of our diversity we're here in the human family there is a fire raging now for the poor of this society they are living in tragic conditions because of the terrible economic injustices that keep them locked in we have to deal with our war economy and systemic racism and systemic poverty and ecological devastation. And finally, we have to deal with the moral narrative. This wall, this is sin of the highest order. We are traveling around this country building this Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival. What we want to do now is hear a little bit from the local community who are a part of this campaign. I've spent five years, five or so more years ho homeless. Living on minimum wage has caused me to have to figure out on a daily basis how to afford basic necessities. While the U.S. sends trillions abroad, my friends, family, and fellow veterans suffer the economic consequences of the war economy. I have two children and I enjoy raising them while acknowledging that being poor is a struggle of human rights. But when I lost my housing, health care, and income all at the same time, I was terrified, panicked. I want to stand here and reclaim the power and dignity of the mujeres in my life. I can't afford to pay a cab. It was one thing to know that you didn't have water and you couldn't afford your water. It's a whole nother to find out that they shut off your entire community and none of you matter. And in the aftermath of climate change disasters, Poor people are, and people of color are the ones to lose their homes. Who can't survive with 725? No parents should have, in America should have to bury their pet, their children for a lack of medical expansion. Being poor is not a sin. Poverty is a sin. Being homeless is not a sin. Homelessness is a sin. We are the living reminder that when they went to throw out their white trash, they didn't burn it. But for those of you who attend a church and you have a choir, the choir is not up there giving that A and B selection before the pastor just because they're cute. The intended purpose is so that they can set the atmosphere, so they can make it ready for prophetic speaking. public policy agenda. The poor, the imprisoned, the brokenhearted, the bruised, the blind, the oppressed, that's where the movement must focus. If it's led by the spirit of the universe. With this first phase though, what we've been doing, as we've said, is traveling to 15 different states across the country, meeting up with leaders from 37 states having mass meetings and having day-long and two-day-long gatherings, trainings, 
to see who's on board, uh, who's in, and can we start to establish these statewide coordinating committees. And we are here, and it's time for us to be the remnant that can transform the nation. Restore the Voting Rights Act. I'm now, to this year we are calling for a season of moral resistance, a season of organizing, a season of nonviolent direct action. There will be a movement that will break through the calm and cut through the lies and bring people together to save the heart and the soul of this democracy and this world. That is not a dream that is happening right now. All across America, people are ready to go. On April the 10th, we will launch at a national briefing the souls of poor folk auditing America 50 years after at the National Press Club. And from there, we will have exactly about um, um, 24 days before the first launch simultaneous in more than 30 states and the District of Columbia. People are ready. The nation is ready. God has shown us that God is ready. And God is waiting on us. As the book of Amos says, God says, if I can get a remnant that will shut down the malls and shut down the factories and cry out in the public square, Amos 5, God says, then I will visit you and give you assistance. So everywhere we go, we ask people, could it be that the breakthrough is simply dependent upon us standing up? And then the spirit of the universe will give us and grant us divine assistance. Thank you for letting us make this, me make this report. I hope it, um, you don't grade but so hard and if so great on the curve. Uh, but I wanted to do it in this way and with video and with some conversation. I know we have a worship service in what? In 15 minutes. In 15 so minutes. So people should just stay put. Right. It'll start right at noon. So I'm sorry y'all might have to hear me again. I know you're gonna say Lord, but just do this. If you are sleepy or tired, in the church back home, we tell people, don't let your head do like that because it look like you're saying no. Just nod like this. <laughs> At least as I said. Norm, did, did I do all right? For, did I represent you all well? Sierra, Willie, Shally, Shally's husband, <laughs> Joe. Anybody else in here, Liz? Eric, is that all right? You can get this video. Uh, Dr. Kim was with us in Selma. Uh, they and specifically asked us to, to bring this energy to Selma and this focus. Go to poorpeoplescampaign.org, send it everywhere, um, sign up. Eric, where can they get this video? Okay, we'll put this video link on the website so you can grab it and send it out everywhere. Just, just, just make it twin, trend, everywhere, just send it everywhere. And I hope um, that at least 92% um, of you all, including this young lady right here that's about 16, we can have you all show up at 2 o'clock. I cannot tell you to do direct action. You have to do it of your own free will and accord. So I can't stand here and say, will you jo join me? I can stand here and say, we will be having. Peter, stand up, Peter, is helping to lead as one of the tri-chairs right here in New York City, the uh, action that's going to happen in Albany. Yeah, give him a big hand. And so um, sign up for the campaign. And uh, also, one more announcement. We have um, the big, big solidarity rally and sending people forth to leave the, the season and to go back and do voter mobilization and building power among the poor is June 23rd in D.C. We need people to come in mass to that. Uh, it's June 23rd. You'll hear more information about that as well. And we got a big boost last week. Liz, we were called, we were invited, not we, something we sought, but we were asked to come on a call with 
groups from 39 other countries who are planning on doing solidarity marches that day and solidarity rallies on June 23rd. Um, and so things are happening um, um, all over the place. Pray, we ask today that this service would be a service of consecration and laying on of hands because on the other side of this, be not mistaken, be not mistaken that the attacks have already started. Um, uh, we have, re no, we know, have reason good, good on good record. Um, you know, all of the places that have come after you and act ugly. And also it's been hard um, on both of our bodies and the team, our team is tired. We had limited team, limited funding. We've run, done stuff that people say couldn't be done in four months or five months. So if you would be so gracious to, to keep us in your prayers, and if you happen to have any resources that you can let go, go to poorpeoplescampaign.org, and I think it's a GoFund or something on the page, and, and please share and tell other people um, if they would. Any questions real quick? I gotta step down for a minute before the service. Any questions? Yes, ma'am. Right. So it's a, it's a card back there. And for those on live stream, it's www.poorpeoplescampaign.org, www.poorpeoplescampaign.org. Let's do this, y'all. Let's do this together. Amen. So, so let's give another round of applause for, for Reverend Barber and for this work. And, and please do stay for the service. We need everyone to, to be a part of this consecration. So it will start in 15 minutes promptly. Um, you know, make yourself comfortable and we'll, we'll be right back.
Are you preaching? Yeah. Would you be open right. to holding the right. microphone? Well, one, two, one, two. That one sounds better than this one. Can you hold it? You mind holding it, or would you rather not? You hold it. Yeah. Just, just a second. Do whatever y'all feel. Okay, are you imagining some stuff? He's going to say, yeah. Is that what you're imagining? He's not going to speak to you, buddy. No, he's going to speak to you, buddy. This mic sounds better than that. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. 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 Just type, take my microphone if you want. Oh, and they have it too. Okay. I think we're good. How you doing? I'm all right. Okay. We're fine. Um, yeah, I think we're, we're cool. Um, do you want to be up here from the beginning of the service, or do you want to come up? Yeah, I'd be too much to get down. I'll just come down for the night. Okay. You got everything you need? You got water? Anything else? I'm fine, Troy. You're the man. That's the system. I know One, two, one, two, just one, two. One, two, one, two, test one, two. Need more? One, two. One, two, one, two, test one, two. One, two, one, two. A little bit more. Is it good there? All right. One, two. One, two, one, two, testing, one, two, one, two. He might do a story on Right, so but the briefing on the report is April 10th. That's why, it's, that's why, it's, yeah, that's why. Okay, thank you. All right, let me ask him. One, two, one, two, testing, one, two. Testing one, two, one, two. Testing one, two. One, two. Testing one, two, three. You good? Okay.
Just throw something together. Just put something together. The young people are looking for some vignettes, like five, six minutes. Yeah. Just something that kind of hits and shows. Okay, of, of the march and the town hall? Yeah, yeah, just the town hall, the front of the steps, the march. Just, just what you do. Is there a deadline on it? Uh, no, I won't get it. Like, I'll read that I'm like, but well, does he need it for 9 o'clock this morning? Uh, Chris Troy. Fred, do you know if somebody's reading the text from Mark? Hey! Lord, how could y'all just let anybody know? If folks could please come take your seats, we need to begin. Please come take your seats.
Good afternoon. Please join me in responsibly reading the call to worship. Here are my servants whom I uphold, my chosen in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon them. They will bring forth justice to the nations. They will cry out. They will lift up their voices. They will make it heard in the streets. They will faithfully bring forth justice. They will not grow faint or be crushed until justice has been established on the earth. God has called you in righteousness. God has given you as a covenant to the people, a light to the nations, to open the eyes that are closed, to release the captives. God has called you in righteousness. God has given you as a covenant a word of prayer. Lord, we thank you. For eons, your prophets have taken on the unpopular, the tiring, and oftentimes costly task of proclaiming you. And God, we are thankful for their witness, thankful that they respond to your holy and righteous call to stand in the public square to proclaim your word of mercy and love, your word of justice. Thank you for giving them as a covenant to the people. And there comes a time, Lord, when we must all stand and become the prophet, when we must cry out as the least of these, as the youngest, as the dispossessed, as the poor, that enough is enough and that we all have a right to live. A time when we must move for the heart and soul of our nation and call for the ending of militarism, economic exploitation, racism, and ecological devastation. A time when we must take our stand on the moral arc of the universe and go all the way, joining the movement toward justice. And so we ask you, Lord, to order our steps, order our thoughts, our minds, our tongues, our action, as your word is proclaimed through this movement, the Poor People's Campaign, the National Call for Moral Revival. Lord, we know that this was a good work that was begun some 50 years ago and then some. We ask you now to be faithful to complete it. Yes, Lord, we say Kairos, now is the time, but Lord, we know all time is in your hand. So we commit ourselves to you first, always, and especially in this time, in this service of consecration. Lord, please order this service. Lord, come by here, come and tabernacle with us. May your spirit rest on us in this place today. May your spirit fall afresh, Lord. Mold us, make us, use us, your prophets, Lord. We ask your blessing as we send out all those gathered here and beyond that are involved in the Poor People's Campaign. We thank you for hearing this prayer, and we give you all the praise and the honor that is due you. In your most holy name, we pray. Amen. This better? Okay. <laughs> Woke up this morning with my mind stayed on freedom. Oh, I woke up this morning with my mind stayed on freedom. I woke up this morning with my mind stayed on freedom. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, singing and praying. I'm singing and praying with my mind. Stayed on freedom. I'm singing and praying with my mind. Stayed on freedom. I'm singing and praying with my mind. Stayed on freedom. Hallelujah. 
Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Woke up this morning. I woke up this morning with my mind stayed on freedom. Whoa, I woke up this morning. I had my mind it was staying. Well, I woke up this morning. I had my mind it was staying. Hallelujah. 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 Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Amen, amen. In this holy week, Welcome to this service of consecration. Welcome to Union Theological Seminary, where faith and scholarship walk together to be a moral force in the world. Welcome also to the Cairo Center for Religions, Rights, and Social Justice, based here at Union Theological Seminary. Cairo has been part of the seminary since 2004 and works to strengthen and expand transformative movements for social change that can draw on the power of religions and human rights. Kairos's co-director, Reverend Dr. Liz Theo Harris, is a co-chair of the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival. We are overjoyed to be here today to lay hands on this campaign, 50 years in the making. The Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival, is uniting tens of thousands of people across the country to challenge the evils of systemic racism poverty, the war economy, ecological devastation, and the nation's distorted moral narrative. If you are in this room today, we have a place for you to join this effort. And today we are honored to welcome the campaign's co-chair, the Reverend Dr. William Barber II. He is the president and senior lecturer of Repairs of the Breach, bishop with the College of Affirming Bishops and Faith Leaders, visiting professor of public theology and activism here at Union Theological Seminary, pastor of Greenleaf Christian Church, Disciples of Christ in Goldsboro, North Carolina. Reverend Dr. Barber is also the architect of the Forward Together Moral Mondays movement that gained national acclaim with its Moral Monday protest, drawing tens of thousands of North Carolinians to their state general assembly, including over 1,200 arrests of peaceful protesters. Bishop Barber is the author of three books, all required reading in this Kairos moment. Let us open our hearts and minds to the good news that comes to us again and again in new ways. Today's scriptural reading. The Passover of the Jews was near and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and the money changers sitting at their seat. Making a whip of cords, he drove all of them out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. He also poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. He told those who were selling the doves, take these things out of here. Stop making God, my parent house, a marketplace. His disciples remembered that it was written, Zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then said to him, What sign can you show us for doing this? Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, This temple has been under construction for 46 years, and will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of the body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. I've read to you John 2, 13 through 22. May God's word become ever active in the lives of all who hear it.
great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father, for there is no shadow of turning in thee. Thou changest not, thou compassions, they fail not. As thou hast been, thou forever wilt be. Summer and winter and Springtime and harvest, sun, moon, and stars in their courses above, they join with all nature in manifold witness to thy great faithfulness, thy mercy and grace. And great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness. Every time I wake up in the morning, new mercies I see. All I have needed, thy hands have provided. Great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness. Oh, Lord, to to me Lord we thank you for your great faithfulness and we pray your blessings and faithfulness upon our endeavors we know that whenever you choose men and women to do anything in your name, <clears throat> you take the risk of putting treasure in earthen vessels, flawed and failing, faithful and focused all at the same time. But you do it so that when that which is done is completed, the excellency of the power might be of thine and not of ours. So cover us and keep us. In your name we pray, amen. So we have to pay attention to the scriptures, particularly when something shows up in all three of the synoptic gospels, Dr. Davey. Uh, any good professor of homiletics would tell you that. But if it shows up in all three of the synoptic gospels, and then on top of that, it shows up in John, it must be really important. Must be really important. And so, as we hear Reverend Uzziah talks about the faithfulness of God, God had made a promise to Israel years and years and years and years and years, and years ago. And in Jesus, that promise begins to come to fruition. But some people did not understand that what they that God's way would be the nonviolent way of the cross, at least as we understand it through the Gospels. What does faithfulness mean? What does holiness mean? What does following God mean? We all have our different experiences. Let me tell you mine. As I look at these three, these four texts, John, Mark, Luke, Matthew, that all talk about this day, that there was a turnover. 
Jesus came into the temple on the first moral Monday. turned over the tables. I want to talk a little bit today about holy agitation. Holy agitation. I really don't want to be involved in agitation just to be involved in agitation. Uh, part of my upbringing theologically flows from the spiritual DNA of what some call the holiness church. My granddaddy was a holiness preacher, Church of God, Anderson, Indiana. And I learned from my grandfather <clears throat> that holiness meant to be set apart and committed by the call of God. I learned early on listening to him, it was to be so consumed and so controlled by the Holy Spirit that one was restricted from doing anything other than what the Lord said. Now, that played itself out in some interesting ways with my grandfather because that also meant you couldn't look at TV after 6 o'clock on Saturday night. And you couldn't eat either because you had to get yourself ready to be fed by the word of God. It meant that you didn't follow the commercialism of Christmas, for instance, or of Easter because that was not the holy way. You focused on the birth of that baby in that barn among those animals and all that it meant. You didn't go around following <clears throat> somebody with red and white suit on and a long beard. You just didn't do that in the holy church. To be holy was what one deacon called having the spiritual can't help it. Uh, it was to know what the hymn writer meant when the hymn writer said there comes a time when there's something within that holdeth the reins. There's something within that banishes all pain. I don't always know but it, I, what it is, but I know there's something within. And then later I studied under the Reverend Dr. William Turner, who's now retiring from Duke, one of the great pneumatologists in this, in this country, in this world, who also grew up in the United Holy Church. And Dr. Turner, in his classes and in my conversations with him, talk to us about the three dimensions of the spiritual life. One dimension is spiritual empowerment and worship. The other was prophetic social consciousness. And the other is holiness. And Dr. Turner taught us, if you have spiritual empowerment and worship, but you have no prophetic social consciousness and no holiness, you're just having a party. And if you have prophetic social consciousness, but you have no worship and no holiness, then eventually the problems you run up against are going to burn you out. And if you have spiritual empowerment and worship and no social consciousness and no holiness, then you'll get lost as to why you're really doing what you're doing. Holiness is a deep commitment in the way of God, no matter what. He said to us, Dr. Turner did, that no matter what we call our spiritual experience, born again, saved, baptized, united, Christian, whatever you want to call it, he said if it doesn't produce a holy quarrel with the world, then it renders our claim of faith suspect. Jesus, in his first sermon, defined the purpose of being set apart at the outset. He said, this anointing is not to put some kind of neon light on me to glow in with a halo around my head and say, he's anointed. No. He said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. For he hath anointed me to preach good news to the poor. In other words, he was declaring that to be set apart by God's spirit was to be engaged in the ministry of declaring good news to the potokos, those who've been made poor by exportation, to heal the brokenhearted, to render sight to the blind, to set the captives free, and to give liberty, freedom to those that have been bruised and battered, and to announce acceptance 
to the unacceptable. That's what Jesus said holiness was about. Colleen, he said it, first sermon. And these were all the signs, if you will, of the ethics of the Holy Spirit. Jesus, the Holy Spirit was not just warm feeling coming up in your chest that may be heartburn. I mean, the reality is for Jesus, the Spirit had its own concerns, its own agenda. And when that Spirit got a hold of you, you had the cane habits. Hmm? So if you know this, it should be no surprise that when Jesus set his face like flint toward Jerusalem and he enters in Jerusalem for the last time before he is crucified as a revolutionary, as a revolutionary, that he would openly and deliberately engage in holy agitation. If you know the scriptures well enough, you know. In other words, Jesus kind of seemed to avoid conflict when conflict was he would just slip away. Go off and pray somewhere. But this time was the time. This was the Kados moment. And he couldn't help it. He was born to take on oppression. He was consecrated for it. And like the prophet before him, holiness meant declaring woe unto those who legislate evil and rob the poor of their right. Holiness meant crying out crying loud and, and, and sparing. Now, holiness wasn't just a form of, of music and worship. It was a way of life. So no wonder when Jesus comes into the Jerusalem, he walks straight into the temple that has become unholy, deconsecrated, if you will, corrupted. And he sees an unholy alliance between the temple, the priest, and the policies of Caesar. In fact, one writer said that when Jesus walked into Jerusalem, it would have been like that building at that time would have resembled a massive, a massive building in Washington, D.C., containing the Pentagon, the U.S. Capitol, the White House, Wall Street, the World Bank, Citibank, Goldman Sachs, Walmart, the National Cathedral, and the Shrine of the Immaculate Conception, all in one. And, and then claiming, God, this is God's home. The faithful, you know, were told to pay God a visit each year, come through Passover to Jerusalem. They had to pay a fee to enter into God's sanctuary. The population tripled. Thousands and thousands of lambs would be purchased and slaughtered. A heavy tax was charged for all of this commerce. In effect, as one writer again says, the temple had become a national bank, offered loans, kept track of debts, changed money so that unclean sinners could be made holy by their money, temple money. And then another fee would be added for the money changing. Women, poor people, and other outcasts and the infirmed had to purchase expensive doves so they would be purified by what they could buy. And then they could worship. These fees were designed to make it expensive to be poor. Robbing the poor. And it was done so in God's name, under the greedy eye and in conspiracy with the empire. And when Jesus sees the court of Gentiles that was supposed to be a place of welcome for all people, where the pair of people that were unwelcome could come for free, no matter their race, their color, their creed, their sexuality, their blemish, or their economic status, when he saw that, that the place meant for the poor had been turned into an economic trap for the poor, when he saw the poor being taken and cheated and exploited and their exploitation being sanctioned by the priest and co-signed by the politician, which each side receiving a kickback, Jesus had to engage in holy agitation. And by turning it over, did you hear that text from John? He turned it over, he ran out everything. It's clear that Jesus wasn't merely talking about lowering the prices. <laughs> he 
He wasn't talking about a little less poverty. You know, let's just cut it by 5%. He really was saying the time has come for the kind of agitation that will turn over the whole system. And even if the system doesn't change, somebody ought to act like it ought to be changed. He announces to the people the same thing that Dr. King announced 50 years ago. His last sermon was supposed to be, America will go to hell if she doesn't deal with this issue of race and systemic poverty and militarism. Jesus said the same thing. He said, the zeal for this house, in other words, the zeal for this system of greed will consume you. The zeal for a kind of greedy capitalism that justifies, justifies exploitation. The zeal for power. The zeal for believing you are somebody based on how you step on or deny other people. It will eventually consume, burn up, destroy. And so he turns over the table announcing in essence, that every person you're exploiting are actually the focus of God. And he knew that the religionists that had chosen to be the puppets of the king and not the prophets of God wouldn't like it. But it was time. And you know, there comes a time that every institution that claims to be in the name of God, whether it's a seminary or a church, has to make some hard decisions. Union, the church I pastor, seminaries have to make hard decisions sometimes of whether we're going to be the puppets of the nation, the puppets of the politicians, or the prophets of God. See, 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 can I do a little zits and laven, you know, setting of the text? Jesus knew that Caesar's overseers were sitting up there in the balcony. Because you know the system will assign its overseers to every institution that claims to be religious. You might not even know they're here. <laughs> they're on your deacon board. They're on your trustee board. Lord help. And their, their purpose is to be here and, and if things kind of get, you know, if union gets too close to the poor people's campaign. If the pastor gets too far out there watching for the system where well, they were there and G and they knew and Jesus knew he knew they were watching to make sure that nothing was ever done to inspire the poor nothing was ever done to oppress uh, uh, to, to challenge the oppression of the oppressors he knew that his nonviolent act that challenged the oppression and the power of Rome would be told run right back to Caesar right back to Pilate and it was set in motion plans for his own death, but it was time. Of course, his action and those teachings threatened and outraged the religious authority. Here he's challenging their economic and political systems that they have consecrated. If we do what he's talking about, we'll lose. And so they planned to kill him. He knew it, but it was time. And there are places in our lives when those of us who've been set apart by the spirit have to know it's time it's time for holy agitation to follow Jesus today we better know it's time it's time for a way of life that challenges systemic poverty systemic racism ecological devastation, the war economy, militarism, and it's time to challenge this false heretical form of Christian nationalism because the zeal for those things are, the, are going to consume the nation unless we step up. It's time. In fact, it's past time. No longer can we stay safely inside of our services, our sanctuaries, and our schools. I believe no longer can you merely go to seminary just to get a good vocation at a nice, safe church. No, not now. Not if you want to be holy. 
So the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for a moral revival, is not merely a commemoration. It's not just an activity. It's not merely going through the motions. No, the, 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 it's, it's not that. The way that so much theology has been hijacked, paid off, bought off, and used in the service of greed and oppression demands holy agitation. It demands that people of faith engage now, not 10 years from now, not, a fifth, not another 52 weeks of prayer, not another season of fasting alone. And we must, and holy agitation says, do it now, not because the people in power will like it, they probably won't. Not because things will immediately change. It probably will not. Not because you're going to be successful in everything you do. No, but because prophetic holiness demands it. Demands it. We have been summoned by the can't help itness of God. The holiness of God. It's time for holy agitation. We can't sit here. When we sit here 50 years after the Voting Rights Act, and we have less voting rights today than we had 50 years ago. We can't keep going. We said this when we went to Selma. We can't keep going to Selma and marching across the Edmunds Pettus Bridge and commemorating what they did back then when every time we march across the bridge, people in policy are marching the other way. That's not holy. We can't let this nation think that her greatest threat is Russia. When in fact voter suppression, racialized voter suppression is really what impacted this election and so many others that have gotten us in the state we're in and the kind of extremism we're in. No, we can't merely be quiet when the criminalization of poverty has raised federal spending on prison to $7.5 billion a year. We only had 188,000 people in prison in 1968. And 50 years later, we've got almost 2 million. Mm -mm. We, can't, we can't just sit around while there's 140 million people living in some form of poverty. And the church and people of faith work harder to get along in the system than to change it. No, the time has come for some holy agitation. 16 million women are in poverty. 13 million children. More than 70% of those living below the poverty line are women and children. This is not just about Donald Trump. This is not just about the immediate realities of our political system. It is about a system gone rogue. This is not just about getting a few new politicians in office who will just tweak it a little bit. There must be some nonviolent turnover and transformation when 1% share of the economy has nearly doubled and 400 of the wealthiest Americans own more than 64% of the bottom of the U.S. population. Three people in this country have the same amount of wealth as 50% of the country, 160 million people. There's no way you can walk into D.C., Jerusalem. You can walk in to the capitals of this state and be okay with that. When we look at the fact that there are half a million people who experience homelessness every night, and 41% are black, 47% are white, many are children, and we look at the devastation, four million people face lead in their water. You can go down the street, what's that street right out there? Broadway and buy unleaded gas. And people cannot buy unleaded water. When we just saw a budget pass and they brag, they brag, they brag, they brag that they had ended the, 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 the partial uh, fix, or just partial of the Obama era that said if you raise one dollar for military, you got to raise one dollar for social spending. They brag that we just got a, a spending um, bill to hold us till September, but we made sure that we put $200 billion more in it for military. 
than we have for social spending. And the country is focused on Stormy and Putin. While the poor and the suffering are being done in and it's, been, and it's being consecrated by religionists who will dare go in and pray for a president and the Congress members who are doing it while they are praying, P-R-E-Y-I-N-G, on the poorest among us. Huh? You think about the wars that we've had. All the wars in the last few years, if you think about it, have either been on black countries, brown countries, or countries with Muslims. There's a that level of racism in our wars, in our wars. 13 million low-income houses can't even afford water. We talk about affordable housing, but what about decent housing for everybody? And just as Jesus, on his entry to Jerusalem, Knowing that the people were watching, knowing that it would be costly, he engaged in nonviolent direct action and sent a signal that this needed to stop, and he engaged in holy agitation. So must we. Now I tell you, as Liz and I and others move around this country, and there's some things I wouldn't even talk about from this podium necessarily but I know it's a season the people are ready the question is are the people of faith ready or do we want to continue to have safe religion that the system will bless and the system might even tithe through every now and then if along with the tithing comes a promissory note we will not protest. I don't know what it's going to cost, but I know it's time for holy agitation. I don't know how quick change will come, but I know if a young lady out in Washington who was homeless for 50 years can come to a poor people's campaign, national call for a moral revival mass meeting and say, I'm here tonight to announce I'm a redneck and I'm also the white trash that America put out but forgot to burn. And I'm joining. It's time. I know if a woman who went into deep depression because she held her baby in Alabama, her daughter who died in her arms from a brain tumor that could have been treated if the Alabama had merely expanded Medicaid. And I know if she can come up out of that depression and say, my baby didn't die in vain, and I'm going to join the movement. I know it's time. I know if a mother will grab Liz's arms and walk into the middle of the Rio Grande River just so she can touch her husband and her child that she had not seen for 16 years, one on one side, one on the other side, and then come back and say, I'm in the movement. I know if, we can get, if we're getting invitations from West Virginia and Kentucky, we're not even inviting ourselves, they're inviting us. I know if the students at Liberty University ask for one of us to come do a revival, and when they couldn't get a space on campus, they said we'll get a space across the street, and already 2,000 people have signed up for young people. I know it's time. I know that when I hear young students talking about this is a moral crisis, refusal to ban assault weapons, I know it's time. I know it's time when sometimes in the middle of the night it seems like I can close my eyes and hear Fannie Lou. And my father. I know when your mother looks at you, Liz, and goes, she's sick, but she's just so proud. It's time I, I don't know. But what I do know, it's like Jesus. We must dare to challenge. And we must not only challenge what he is, 
not only curse the darkness, but we must point away to what ought to be. We must declare what must be. And we must not be afraid of holy agitation. In this season, in this holy week, let us decide that holiness is not something we should run from. Holiness should not be seen as those folk over there that speak in tongues and do strange things. But holiness is declaring that in this season we do need a new tongue. And we need some people who've had enough experience with the divine that they ain't afraid of no Caesar. And they're not afraid of any false prophets. And nonviolently, with love and truth, they are willing to dare to engage in holy agitation. Because that is the only hope, I believe, for this democracy and even for this world. Grant it, Lord, that you might use us for holy agitation in this Kairos moment to repair the breaches of this world. Amen. And now let this time, I come forward to anoint the Reverends Barbara and Theo Harris as leaders of the Poor People's Campaign Movement. I anoint you at this time with oil as a symbol of God's spirit that will empower you to go forth in the faith that calls us to partner with God in mending our world of the violence that is poverty, the violence that is bigotry, the violence that is homophobia, transphobia, the violence that is militarism, and all forms of crucifying violence that deny God's people of their sacred humanity and the value of their sacred lives. And so at this time, Reverend Barbara, I anoint you with oil in the name of the Creator, Redeemer, and Liberator, that you may go forth proclaiming the good news to the poor of God's peace, which is justice. At this time, I anoint you, Reverend Theo Harris, in the name of the Creator, Redeemer, and Liberator, that you may go forth proclaiming God's peace to the poor, a peace that is God's justice. I'm going to ask all the people who are working with the Poor People's Campaign, everybody who intends to volunteer for the campaign to come forward uh, now. All, anybody who's working with the Poor People's Campaign, um, anybody who plans to volunteer, we all just come forward, come around the front here, and then um, please come around the front here so that just fill in the front here. Anybody who is working or plans to volunteer, please just come forth. Jen. And we're going to ask everybody just to lay a hand on somebody next to them uh, on the shoulder. Everybody should be appropriately touching somebody else. Amen. Holy. Holy. Holy touching. All right. And then we're going to ask Jen Hagedorn, who is the co-chair of our student senate here, 
to start the commissioning, and I will end it with a prayer. God, on this day of holy agitation, this day of disruption and truth-telling, we stand before you to commission Reverend Dr. William Barber, Reverend Dr. Liz Theo Harris, and the many, many, many children of yours who are going to be carrying out the important work of the Poor People's Campaign. God, we thank you for their willingness to answer your call, a call that is not easy, a call that comes with sacrifice, a call that comes with danger. God, we thank you for their willingness to answer this call as so many prophets and leaders have in every generation before. We feel your spirit in this room, O oh God. We feel how you are moving through us, and we feel that newness that is coming, that is just around the corner. We ask that you be with your people, be with those who are in this room, those who cannot make it to this room, those who will never make it to this room. We ask that you move through us to create your more perfect kingdom here on earth, in this moment. Lord God, we know that you call us out to holy agitation. You call us out of ourselves. You call us out and set us apart in a world that is longing for your grace, a world that is longing for your love, a world that is longing for your truth and for your justice. In our community, Lord, our poor people and poor souls, who need to experience your grace. In our nation, Lord, our poor people and poor souls who need to experience your love. In our world, our poor people and poor souls who need to experience your truth. In our world, our poor people and poor souls who need your divine justice. We are your people, Lord God, and you have called each of us out to be visible in this world to exhibit you in this world. As you work in the hearts and lives of Reverend Barber and Dr. Liz Theo Harris, we ask that, that you would let your spirit keep them wholly agitated, keep them called out and set apart. Indeed, keep all gathered here, agitated and ready to speak a word of truth and love and justice and peace on behalf of those who are poor and who are poor in their souls. Let us support these, your disciples, your people, in every way as they answer the call to promote a campaign to keep the needs of the poor before an often cold-hearted and complacent nation. Strengthen them as they go out to answer this call that they right, might run this race and not grow weary, that they might walk the path of protest for justice and for economic equity and not grow faint. Support them and sustain them in all that they do, not only on this day, but now and for all the days to come. God bless them. God bless them all. Amen. Amen. We have heard our marching orders, and they are indeed about marching. We are called to be faithful to the cry of the prophets through the ages and to the words of Isaiah 58. If you remove the yoke from among you, the pointing of the finger, the speaking of evil, if you offer your food to the hungry and satisfy the needs of the afflicted, then your light shall rise in the darkness. Your gloom be like the noonday. The Lord will continually guide you and satisfy your needs in parched places. 
make your bones strong. You shall be like a watered garden, like a spring of water whose waters never fail. Your ancient ruins shall be rebuilt. You shall raise up the foundations of many generations. You shall be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of the streets to live in. So let us go out and repair the breach. Let us leave here and restore the streets to live in. Let us join together and raise the foundation of many generations. Let us bring about a radical revolution of moral values. And let each of us here engage in a season of organizing, of educating, of voter registration and voter mobilization and movement building. Let each of us here turn over those tables, engage in holy agitation. Let us sign up to be moral defibrillators moral witnesses who will engage in nonviolent moral fusion direct action. Let each of us here be one in the numbers when the saints go marching in. So as we close this service, ready to keep up the fight, Please join me in a chant for this movement coming from North Carolina. Forward together. Forward together. Forward together. Amen. Thank you.